Oh, man. All right. Well, Johnny Owens, thanks for coming on on the podcast. This is episode two in Midwest Rehab Institute's Clinical Leadership Podcast. We're really excited to have you here. And uh, for those of you that don't know, Johnny Owens is a, a physical therapist down in the great state of Texas. And uh, he is, uh, 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 well, he can, he can tell you a little bit more about Owens Recovery Sciences. And so, um, Johnny, why don't you, for some of the viewers and listeners that don't know anything about you, they've been living under a rock maybe for the last 15 years, um, why don't you uh, just briefly introduce yourself and give us a little bit of your background and how you landed with uh, ORS. Yeah. Well, well, first, Alex, thanks so much for having me on. It's always an honor to get on these. And um, I like this one because I, I know you already um, and we've been friends for, for a while. And um, so it's, it's nice to do these with, with people I know and, 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 and respect and enjoy talking to. So, so thanks for having me on. Yeah, the feeling's definitely and, mutual, uh, my friend. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, and down here, we say the great country of Texas. So, um, sorry about <laughs> my mistake. So sorry. <laughs> no, so I'm a physical therapist. Um, um, I've been one since 1998. Uh, and uh, when, you know, I pretty much kept all of my life pretty much in Texas, except for a brief sprint, a uh, little stint in New Orleans. But I went, went to the University of Texas at Austin for undergrad, University of Texas Medical Branch um, for my PT. And um, yeah, that, that's kind of kind of what my background is. And I've got a lot of stuff, I guess, in the middle that may or may not be interesting. Yeah. So after you graduated and you went into, you know, your, your you know, career of, of being a physical therapist, what, uh, what, did that, uh, what did that period look like, that you know, early middle ground for you? What did that look like? Where did that land you? And, you know, when, when I graduated, it was like the heyday of physical therapy. And, and it, was, it was really hard to get into school back then. I'm really surprised I, I even got in. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I barely got out of high school. My dad was pushing for me to be a butcher because um, he was worried I would never get into college. He's a mechanic, so oh, college was, yeah, it was, was kind of foreign to him anyways. And uh, um, so there, were, there, was a, there wasn't anything holding back um, therapy as far as billing. So I kind of had the pick of the litter um, as far as jobs. And, and the year after I got my job, uh, Medicare made some drastic changes um, around 99. And, and like the jobs just like, you know, cut in half. Um, so I was lucky. And, um, you know, so I, I, I like so many PTs, uh, we, we all kind of like sports. Um, I, I played sports. I played uh, soccer, semi-pro, played soccer in college, the typical like every person is different probably um and so i don't need to i want to do sports medicine after that and so um i i started at a at a place called the center for performance um just outside of galveston and i also took a second job at a private clinic that paid a lot more to try to decide do i want to be kind of more in this like um system you know more you know hospital type but but building with a big orthopedic group and trying to build these programs and a bunch of high schoolers and junior colleges or you know at a private practice could make a lot more money um and so i, I took two jobs um, and, and kind of split it up. I asked if I could do seven to four at one and, and then do part time at the other place. Um, I would run over real quick and work from 430 to about nine, seeing the kids afterwards. And um, I chose the, the less money and the, the practice that I really liked. And um, so that, that's where I started. And, and it was kind of just setting up this new orthopedic sports medicine practice. OK, that, that gives us a nice little segue into, you know, kind of your, your early early stages after graduation and yeah and was opening up a PT clinic ever on your radar is that something that, that Johnny was, wanted yeah. to do yeah and that was a fatal flaw um so I, I left where that practice and you know the the kind of bad story I, I left with a girl and because of a girl um who finished her med school and got a residency in in New Orleans and um, I said, you know, I think New Orleans would be cool, and, and I really like this girl. And so we went there. I worked at Tulane um, for just a brief stint, Tulane Institute of Sports Medicine, and then I worked um, at the Rehab Institute of New Orleans as their as their clinic director, um, trying to kind of establish their sports medicine program. And then decided, yeah, I, I really need to hang my shingle, and and I miss Texas. If you're from Texas, um, there's certain things, you know, if you if you've never been out of Texas when you leave. We have HEBs, it's our grocery store. 
and like there's there's like a website that talks about like you know like the missing of HUVs and, and not having a water burger is a big freaking deal <laughs> and um, and also um, not being near University of Texas Longhorn sports um, I couldn't watch the games that much on the weekends and also I think my liver was hurting from living in New Orleans and that girl and I broke up so oh, I had no. so I, many I didn't years. want to bring it up but I was gonna no no it was it was the best thing that happened hopefully she has a listen to this it, it, yeah it was more of my <laughs> problem than hers. Um, so yeah, so a buddy of mine had just joined with some business guys and started some clinics in San Antonio, Texas. Um, and so I decided to partner up with them and I didn't have to put in any capital, um, but uh, you know, and I got an equity piece. Um, and, and so the, the things that I, I would caution anyone just starting their first business is be careful of starting a business with anybody. Um, and maybe starting it with your, with your buddy isn't always the best idea. Um, and with starting just maybe three years out of school probably isn't your best idea, at least for me it wasn't. Um, and, and then shady business people um, that are in it for the buck might think completely differently than you do from the clinical perspective. And so we butted heads tremendously. Um, and then I realized after about a year of that that I, I needed to get out of this situation. And, and so I didn't have to give up any money, gave up some equity and, and walked away from that and said, I, I can't be in this situation. Okay. So after that, where did that lead you next? So after that, um, I was, I was kind of deciding, like, do I try and, and get into, you know, a, a university kind of sports practice, get with a team or something like that. And um, one of the, one of the partners in our group was a retired Colonel at the army base here. And um, you know, we have with the reimbursement, the lack of visits, you know, visits were already getting cut. You know, we get a young ACL patient and get like maybe six or eight visits. If you're um, and I was, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and so I was like, let's just keep seeing them or charge a nominal fee. And the business guys were like, that doesn't work. And, and so, you know, he said the military, <laughs> you don't really have to worry about that. You, you, if right. you want to see a patient for freaking 10 years, as long as you're at the base, you can. And, and that's also a bad thing. Sometimes you can't get rid of these, these guys. But um, so he's like, I'll put in a word. I know they're trying to bring in a kind of a stronger sports medicine kind of approach. And um, so he got me an interview at the base here in San Antonio. And if you've, not, if you've never been to San Antonio, it's a huge military city. They call it Military City USA. We have, we have the biggest kind of medical footprint is here. Brook Army Medical Center is what it was. Now it's San Antonio Military Med Medical Center. Every military medic Army, Navy, um, Air Force will come down here and they do their training. We have a giant Air Force base here. Um, and, and so I got in and I got in um, to kind of help ramp up their sports medicine program and um, come on just kind of as a, as a contract PT. And that was right as the wars were starting, um, we, which I've been asked our chief in, in the interview, you know, it, you know, it seems interesting and that you guys are kind of talking about ramping up the sports medicine program. We're, we're in this war. Um, that seems like it might be taking more precedent, you know, and I was kind of selfishly also worried, you know, was there going to be assets given to this program they were wanting to build? And is this all going to be, you know, trauma care and war based, which I knew nothing about and didn't want any part about. And, and she said, you know, um, the first desert storm, it was, we thought it was going to be a, a big, big conflict. And we were very worried because we had never been to war in, in forever since really Nam and, um, and so in Korea. And so she's, you know, she said, we overprepared for that. And it lasted, you know, very, sh very short duration, almost minimal to no casualties, um, especially that came down to Brook Army. And so she said, we really feel like the second operation enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom is going to be like that a, a short term kind of duration. We're going to keep kind of steady climate here. Um, and we think we can handle the load. And it was completely opposite, obviously, as everybody knows, um, you know, rather than being a special forces driven war, we get in, get out, hopefully prove our point. Um, we wrote a paper in the journal of orthopedic trauma with, with a bunch of my orthopedic friends there. Um, not so ago called what we learned from 14 years of war. And so my life forever changed when I took that position. Um, and and I, I still always had that kind of sports medicine approach in my gut. Um, but, but my passion became the combat casualty. And, and that's when I started kind of moving into what can we do for, for big, bad kind of boom trauma? Um, and how can we look at this cohort 
from potentially what we know from this sports medicine approach. You know, big, big boom trauma um, lots of times in the civilian sector. Um, it's either an indigenous pop, you know, or, a, or a poor population um, or someone who doesn't maybe have insurance benefits or if someone does, they've burned a lot of their benefits and you, and you only see a trickle of these, you know, people that come in with big polytrauma. Um, all of a sudden we're seeing, you know, multiples of those every Monday morning being flown in. And so um, we start seeing there's a lot of, of problems um, in our profession that we had in, in that kind of orthopedic care. So that kind of, that brought you into the military, right? You were, you're not an enlisted individual. You just, you were just brought in yeah. correctly. You, um, yeah. and so uh, it, it's interesting kind of hearing this backdrop because I, I just assumed you had a military background, you know, and so mm -hmm. I, I didn't quite realize that. Um, so it's really fascinating. And, and I, I greatly appreciate your, like you just recognize how like uh, it, it, it was going to be a little bit of a bigger job uh, than you maybe even uh, initially imagined, but you just kind of raced after it no matter, no matter what kind of nonetheless. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about why you started to first research into BFR and uh, yeah. what, kind of, what kind of piqued your interest on that. I know that's, you know, talked about at the courses and stuff, but sure. just give, give a little commercial about like where, where that kind of entered into your thought process there. Yeah. So I, I never really had thoughts of doing research at all. You know, I'm a, I always was, I like the clinic. I'm a clinician. Um, and, and we were just so freaking busy. And, and, and I'll say w part of what just made that time there kind of so magical from a medical person's perspective is, is just, and you see this in other conflicts in, in Nam and World War II, the way the military medical complex comes together to solve solutions. And, and it's not just the medical side, it's the military given support be it funding, be it command level, um, the civilian sector partnering with us, um, our scientists. And, and we just had, it's an amazing think tank. And, and again, it's not just military, it's, you know, Pittsburgh and UPMC and, and Duke and Wake and, you know, all these other institutions. And, and in Europe, you know, with, with Headley Court and some of those folks were, were kind of working with each other. And so <laughs> my life changed in two components. One, I, I had our sports clinic and robust, you know, we put a paper out there, you know, you know, there was only, you know, a few thousand amputees in, in the wars, you know, people think there's a ton, but there really weren't. A lot of assets got thrown in that direction. There was a lot more limb salvage patients. Um, and those are people that were trying to keep their limb um, or had it mangled enough that they could have lost it. And then Brett Owens and his um, colleagues who were in the military, they're out now, they put a paper out that's looked at a 10 year window and we had 50,000 ACLs um, in, in the, in the military during that 10 year windows of the war as well, not just in the war and training and everything, but there was a huge orthopedic sports medicine issue. And the quicker we could get an ACL back or a cartilage injury or whatever, the, the quicker we could get our, our assets back onto the battlefield or into support. And so we were slammed. I mean, so, so busy in our little sports clinic. And then Dr. Roman Haida came walking in one day and he was our chief of trauma. He said, Johnny, I would love for you to start taking some of my limb salvage patients um, into your sports clinic. And, and he said, I, everyone's nervous of what to do with them. And these are, you know, a limb salvage is someone who comes in and, and typically we see them, their limb was just completely destroyed from blast, gunshot, whatever. And they're in, most of them were in a big Taylor spatial frame or the Zalrof frame, a big external fixator, sometimes bilateral. Typically they had these pelvic fractures and TBIs along with it. <laughs> I was like, man, you're, you're, you're on crack, doc. I don't, I don't know if these guys are going to fit in here. I don't, those, those frames scare me. Um, I'm not sure what we'll do with them, but we, we started taking them in. And next thing you know, we had way more limb salvage patients than we did um, our sports folks. Um, because it was just a mass crush of those guys. And so I kind of, I think I maybe became kind of the, one of the leading physical therapy experts in the world of how to handle that kind of trauma and in, 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 in frame rehab and what you do post frame rehab and what you do and, and stuff like that. So that changed and all of a sudden I'm seeing just tons of limb salvage and pushing a lot of my sports off to my other therapist or, or, or other folks. And then uh, that when, some, your title, that when your title changed from yeah. sports medicine to sports medicine and limb salvage, yeah. you know, you have these glorified titles. Um, they're careful because they give you these actual ones and, and you get a pay grade with it, you know, so they avoid that. So, you know, like the chief would be like, Hey man, you, I want you to be chief or director of sports medicine at Brook Army. And I was like, all right. 
you know, don't put it on your tagline, but that's what I'm calling you. And so when you go talk at conferences, and then um, after that, uh, Colonel Ficke, who was our chief, he, he's at Johns Hopkins now, he said, uh, you know, I, I think you also need to be something with limb salvage. So let's make this director of sports medicine and limb salvage rehabilitation, which to this day, I, I still think I'll hold that, that title as the sole holder because um, I don't think anyone wants the, I'm, I run sports medicine and limb salvage clinics together. Um, they, they don't mesh well. And, and so what happened is then one day, right, you, you could walk and there's a little breezeway and there's another building next to our rehab facility. And um, that's where our scientists are. And it's the burn ward, the Institute of Surgical Research. And the, the, the physiologists are there, our bone guys are there, the animal labs there, just brilliant minds. And, and um, Tom Walters, who's one of the physiologists there, he, 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 he's one of the experts on, on tourniquets and tourniquet trauma. And so this isn't BFR related right off the point, but he came over and asked me um, if I knew how to do a biodex. <laughs> And I said, yeah, you know, I know how to do a biodex. Um, we have them here and that our sports docs require that for testing. And he said, well, all these guys you have that have missing pieces of muscle, we're worried that that's always going to be a functional deficit. And we can't regrow these little chunks of muscle. So with every blast injury, you know, you think about the bone or the amputation, but there was also just these just chunks of, of muscle and flesh left on the battlefield from the limbs. And what we started to see, and we wrote a paper on it, you know, that almost equaled a 92% disability rate in those cohorts of people that lost just small chunks of muscle. Mm -hmm. And so they said, we, we will just love someone to track, are they getting stronger um, through a rehab? And uh, I said, well, maybe it just means my rehab sucks, you know, <laughs> that they're not getting stronger. But we were put on through some pretty robust rehab. And, um, and so I started tracking that. And then we, we got done with it. I, this problem and and so that's where I kind of learned the secret sauce of how we would do our research is we would find a problem and we would try and identify it and and it's not a study but in clinically we're, we're tracking things and saying this is a problem this is a problem this is a problem and then we would write a paper and just say look this is a problem and we don't have a real solution and then we would look and try and find a potential solution and if there's a potential solution especially during the war in the DOD we had a pretty fast track mechanism. If it looked like it was gonna help and it wasn't gonna hurt um, and we'd run the risk rewards, we would kind of get to quickly implement it without it being a study at times and then, and then retrospectively look back and say, did it fix that problem? So we would write all these, these are the problem papers and we would do these retrospective, we tried this, it didn't help or we tried this and it helped. And so that was the first kind of, I wrote some book chapters, but that was the first foray into like, all right, I'll write a paper. And I, I freaking hated writing the paper. It was terrible. I'm, I'm from West Texas. English is like a second language for us out there. <laughs> um, but the, um, the process of doing that was, was awesome to me and realizing like, well, I, this is very easy. And then we would start in those guys, we, we became really close partners. And they're like, all right, now we're going to try regenerative medicine techniques. So we're going to put in, you know, some stem, or we're going to put in a, a graft, or we're going to put in an extracellular matrix, or extracellular matrix plus ground up matrix, and let's start seeing do those make changes. And, and that was like the most fun I've ever had of like, oh, wow, I've identified a problem. Now we're working as this giant cohort, and we're like, okay, let's do this. Or we would call the McGowan Institute of Pitt of, what are you guys doing? Okay, that sounds good. Let's try it. And they're like, wow, we're just, we just finished the animal model. We're like, cool. I got like 20 guys ready for it. <laughs> and so it was, it was beautiful. And, and the, the guys appreciated that we were, you know, tip of the spear. You know, we're not, not going to harm them, you know, other than the risk of second surgeries and things like that. Um, and so then we started putting out these regenerative medicine papers. And I really got the, like, I'm, I'm into this research side. Um, and then it was like, I need to go get my PhD. Um, and, and then I kind of realized, well, there's a lot of smart PhDs that are around me. Um, there's a lot of statisticians. I don't even do the stats. You know, we get done and we give it to our statisticians because we don't want to, you don't want your researcher doing the stats. You want them to review it, but I don't want to manipulate them at all. I understand right. the stats to a, to a basic level. Um, so then I'm like, well, I can just, I don't need to slow down. I need to be in the, in the guts of this. And, and just keep doing this and, and start looking at solutions because we had a ton of problems. We were failing the limb salvage patient. We were having a, a high rate of delayed amputations where these, these guys and girls would come back, you know, one, two, three, five years later and be like, hey, 
I need to go and cut my leg off. This isn't working. And that's, that keeps you up at night. Cause I, I personally, these guys all had my cell numbers. I knew them. I knew their families. Um, and it's like, man, you start really at night. Like what's my, what am I missing here? So that was moving into that research world. Then we realized, okay, one major problem is it's going to take a long time to truly regenerate muscle and, and tissue like we would like. Um, although that's, that's starting to come around much more and I'm still involved in that. So then we said, let's move way outside the box. We had a think tank called Streck, and that was um, scientists, orthopedic surgeons, rehab people, prosthetists, command people, all of us would get together in, in rooms and discuss like, what's the problem? How are we gonna fix it? So we decided to, to look at, can we build a prosthetic around the limb salvage limb? And so that was our next big project after regenerative medicine. And um, we had a lot of mini ones, but that one became this, this thing called the IDEO, the Intrepid Dynamic Exoskeletal Orthosis. And, and we basically would build these exoskeletons onto someone who was saying, I wanted to cut my leg off to try it and see if it gave them what they wanted. Reduce pain, or most of them would say, I just want to run. I just would love to redeploy as a ranger or something like that. And that was extremely successful. And the DOD patented that device. Um, we've got thousands of service members. I've got guys deployed right now that are using it um, with, with our special forces. Um, and, and so that was a, a project. I think we, we spun out like 13 papers. We've got more trials ongoing. But the problem was both those cohorts and the orthopedic patient, the ACL patient, were never getting true muscle quantity and quality back to what we liked to make that idea work, to make the regenerative medicine techniques work, or to say, yeah, I feel like this, this de novo cartilage procedure or this ACL is at 110% of, of baseline. Typically, there was a deficit. So then we said, okay, we got a problem with strength. We got a problem with muscle wasting. Um, we have a problem with fibrosis. Um, and, and then we started trying to skin the cat. You know, one of the first things we looked at is let's just go straight to anabolics. Um, and, and Joe Shu, who was my buddy, he became the new trauma doc. Um, he, I, that's the quickest I think any potential study has been shot down. I think he got the word steroid out of his mouth before the general like said, don't even think about it. Um, so we didn't get to just shoot steroids and, and any anabolics into the service members. So um, blood flow restriction became something that was very fascinating to us. And it was in its infancy. It what really wasn't being done in the United States, um, but it, it was being done. I mean, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I pride myself that I have every BFR paper there is, and I just got one the other day from 1937. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the paper, when I found it scanned, um, and Grant Mouser, who, who's from Jeremy Lenicky's lab, I credit him because he cited it in one of his papers. Um, it looks like the freaking uh, Declaration of Independence. It's all like brown. And, you know, it's like, you know, you're reading the abstracts like colloquial. They're like talking with each other in it. Um, but there, were, there was a ton out there. You know, there was like physiological studies done, um, Sunberg's group in the 90s looking at it. And some of our physiologists were, were familiar with it. And they were like, yeah, I think this is something we should explore um, to see if it helps with Johnny's problem that, that these, the muscle quality isn't where it should be. So that's a long winded of how we came around to doing it. Yeah. Well, it, it, I find it fascinating because, you know, I've gone through the course a few times. I've, I've been privileged enough to sit in on your course a few times and Ben Weatherford's course as well. And Zach uh -huh. Dunkel, um, who I don't think ever sleeps. Um, but, no, he uh, doesn't. That guy's, that guy's insane. Well, he's yeah. a Marine sniper, you know, so he oh, makes yeah. us nervous. We're all going to bed at conferences and he's just sitting there on the couch, like reading. Like, what are you, what are you doing at night, man? Unreal. Well, he's, he's yeah. had two, two serious travel delays on the two classes I've, I've sat in on with him. Yeah. We will like just drive up to the class and just start teaching it at like all night. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he's, 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 yeah and he, he does not just a cup of coffee and he's good to go. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's just a testament to the guys that you have lined up teaching for you. And, yeah. and uh, we'll get into that in a little bit about like, you know, the, you know, branching into Asia and, 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 you know, some instructors now taking off with Taiwan and, and all the amazing things you're doing worldwide, but, um, Barcelona. you know, yeah, Barcelona as well. And Steve Patterson's group in, in the UK teaching for you as well. Correct. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, so you got, got a lot of amazing things going for you, but, yeah. um, that, that kind of leads us into a nice place where you have this nice secure position within the military and you decide to take a leap. Um, I yeah. remember talking to you one time and, and over dinner, and I remember you said something that was really, it really impacted me. And, it, and you basically went home and, and correct, you can tell the story if you want, but correct me if I'm wrong, where you went home, you told your wife, you know, 
honey, we're selling the house. You know, basically in so many words. <laughs> and, uh, and that just like, that got to me uh, on a different level because I've had many of those tough conversations with my wife and my family. And, and, uh, and that's, that's what, what, you know, classified as the big leap where you leave from a place of certainty into a place of uncertainty. And yeah. that's what, that's what, uh, I think uh, draws me towards you and towards your leadership because you're willing to put the comfort aside in order to pursue something bigger and ultimately something bigger than yourself, um, which was really cool to listen, to hear you explain that thought process. So for our listeners, just explain what I'm going to call the big leap from when you left the military into jumping into full-fledged ORS worldwide. Yeah, man, that, that was very, very difficult. Um, and I think that, that, I think that that needs to be addressed because a lot of people probably look at you now and they go, Oh, well, that's a guy that just started BFR. And I I don't think they recognize, or maybe even they don't, maybe they don't know, but you know how tough it was to make that decision. So I'm just going to let that resonate with everyone because I recognize how challenging that could have been. So keep going. Yeah. You know, when, so nowadays it's interesting and, and you see, it's always, it's all this stuff of like how to leave your job or how to start your own business. And, you know, I, I had an amazing job. I mean, I'm at the center for the intrepid. It's like the freaking Disney world of rehab. We have everything. Um, and, and I was a GS perm, which is basically like, I have to kill someone to get fired. Um, so I'm, I'm at a, at a nice level. Um, as far as pay grade, I'm, I've got autonomy. You know, I, I had the reign of everything. You know, we're doing stories with, NPR and Time Magazine and you know you're just like and, and, and I've got all this great assets um, and, and so I, I think I'm on the spectrum of uh, of um, like Asperger's or something like whenever I get like my head into something I, I just I can't stop thinking about it just like sober medicine um, you know these guys were talking muscle to me and, and in talking about things that, you know, you know, the satellite cell and, you know, we need, we need to look at what the extracellular matrix is doing. Um, and then, you know, all this myostatin and stuff like that. I'm like, what the hell are you guys talking about? And so, you know, I, I got like every physiology book I could. And those guys probably got so sick of me of just living like in their labs, like, tell me exactly what you're doing on this rat. And what is this, you know, satellite cell you're talking about? Um, same thing with the exoskeleton. It just took over my world for like, you know, eight years. And, and so I couldn't, do anything but just just think about just the way we were doing blood flow restriction, how we could um, manipulate and make it keep happening, and and, and it was all I could think about. And um, we uh, we were winding down, so the wars basically were officially over, and the center for the Atrepin was changing from we were getting the guys from the battlefield to now we're we're taking care of just the the troops at home, you know, the typical kind of training injuries. And, and so that was one thing that made me feel comfortable because I, I always knew like as long as we were getting these manifests and we were getting service members flying in from overseas, um, I kind of had this pull that I was, uh, you know, that I was the person that could handle this certain patient that, that would come in. Um, when that wasn't there as much, so I was like, okay, I don't feel this responsibility anymore. Um, and then it came to this point, like I, do I really want to break off and run a business? Um, that's something I'd never even considered before. My, my, actually my dad's side, my granddad and my dad, they run their business, but they're, they're mechanics. Um, and they love tinkering with cars and they've just like, they own a mechanic shop. Um, so I don't know if that was an entrepreneurial gene, probably not. Um, but, um, so I just, I just had to kind of come to grips of like, okay, do I want to, break off and maybe try and do this on my own and start trying to just consult. And, and so that's what I wanted to do. So I, I, at first I said, I'm just going to go consult and work with teams and universities and, and just kind of discuss with them how, how you would do this. Um, and, and so what happened is in the military, if you want to do something on the side, you have to submit an off duty employment packet and you know, I got some kind of publicity after a certain NFL guy I worked with. It was Javen Clowney. It's in the media. He did really well. And then I spoke at the combine and I had all these teams hitting me up and the military said, I'd have to submit an off duty employment packet um, for every team, for every university. Those would take like a month. I was like, man, at this rate, like 10 years until I'm finally cleared to like go do this. 
Um, and, and so I, I told my wife, you know, I, I think I want to break off and just start my own consulting business on, on my own, leave the military. Um, and she said, like, leave, leave, like, quit. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I, I just, I feel like, you know, it'll be a distraction and, and I can't give my all. Um, I don't want to like do part of one and part of the other. I have to just focus a hundred percent. Um, and, and so I emailed this guy, Seth Godin. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, so I, you know, maybe, I, I, maybe it's the a DOD. I don't remember how I got his email. Somehow I got his email. Well, I, I, like, I, legend had it, has it that Seth Godin will respond to every email. It might just be one word or it might be yeah. one sentence, but he will respond to every email. So once you get his email, if you shoot him an email, apparently he responds to every yeah. email. So keep going. Yeah, well, I emailed him and I, you know, I'm like, hey, Seth, I'm at a crossroads. You don't know me, you know, like such a, <laughs> just an ass email. Um, and I'm like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And, you know, I've, I've got this great job and I'm not sure what I'm going to leave. And he's like, don't quit your day job keep kind of doing it on the side, see if it is what makes you passionate and what you want to do more. And lastly, like you said, see if you want to lead and no one's going to start their own business without leading others. And you can't be doing this just for yourself. If it's just you, then you're a consultant and it's just a consultancy. And maybe you can do that on your own. And so I thought about, it, I was like, do I want to just do a consultancy or do I want to actually have a true business um, where we have, Others, like you said, our, our trainers who are as impassioned as we are, our staff here in San Antonio who are just as impassioned as I am. And I decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I told my wife, you know, uh, I don't want to have to take money from anyone. I don't want to have to borrow money from a bank. I don't want to ever have to compromise um, by worrying about the mortgage. And so can we sell the house? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and use that money um, to get this thing going um, while, while I, I kind of get our feet off the ground. And she's like, and live where? And I was like, well, I was thinking like, I found this apartment. It's a two bedroom, <laughs> it's close to downtown. You know, it's, it's real cheap. And she, you know, we had a beautiful home. I've got two daughters, you know, that were both in school and, and, and God bless her. And, and I think that's the most important thing. If, if you have a significant other, is putting it out, you know, because she said, why are you doing this again? And she's like, you've never been like, you want, you're like going for the money. You're always like into, you know, what, what you say, like makes you, I hate the word passion, but kind of what like keeps you up at night and you can't stop thinking about it. And I said, that's it. You know, this is, I'm, I'm, I just really want to focus hundred percent of my efforts on this. Um, and I, and I want to get it out there. Um, and I think this is something that's ready for prime time. Um, it, like I said, this, geez, seven or eight years ago now, it, it wasn't really being done a whole lot when we were first starting, and I said, I, I think this is something that the clinicians could do right away. And, and I think once I get out there, we're going to see it's, it takes off, not just from what I say, others are going to start doing it and, and it'll become part of practice. And, and I think I can, I can help more people than just me being in the clinic. So she said, okay. <laughs> and, and so we did, we moved into a little two bedroom apartment and um, started a business without really knowing anything about business at all. Um, and it's, it's super hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Um, and, and you know, you're a business owner. Um, and you probably are better at it than I am. I, I messed I up. So much. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, I messed up so much along the way. So, so that's, that's kind of, I get, I'm sorry, I get long winded, but that, yeah, that's, that's kind of how, yeah. 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 So that kind of brings it to like, so you made the decision to make the leap and then you know, was it just, just by yourself or did you have enough capital then initial capital from selling to the house to then hire a staff or did you, you kind of did everything yeah. up front and then when, when did you realize, Oh my gosh, there's a thousand things that go into this. You know, I, yeah. I need some help here. And then, and then, uh, you know, yeah. And then we'll go from there, but yeah, go ahead. Right. So I had enough money to hold us over because I, I, I didn't have a lot of overhead. You know, there wasn't like I didn't need a, a, a clinic. I didn't need a brick and mortar. Um, I needed some money to travel and I was hoping I could get the teams to cover that. Um, you know, like even knowing with the charge, that's the that's the weirdest thing. You know, um, the first ones I did were free. I was just like, you know, I just want to do this. And if you like it, will you tell somebody? Um, and, and so I, I think even, I don't like the freemium kind of model, like, Hey, I'm going to give you this for free and then I'm going to hit you up for charges. Oh, on relentlessly. Yeah. Relentlessly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, just so, yeah. like, 
a freaking webinar now. It's like, don't even sign up for them because it's just going to be a sales pitch at the end. Right. So I was just like, look, I'll do this. And you decide if you do or don't like it. If you do tell your buddies and if you don't mind, um, and, and I'd be happy. And, and, and so, you know, then I would do a training with the team and I think it was the Detroit Lions and Kevin Bastion afterwards I got done and, you know, I, we charged, or I charged a fee and I was like, what do you think of that price? And he's like, I think you should charge more. <laughs> so I was like, all right, good. I like to hear that. It's yeah. so uh, finding these price points, but then, you know, people don't, even the teams, you know, it's not that they don't pay, but you'll do something and maybe you're getting paid three, four, five, six months later because it's going through their accounting. You're like, dude, I got to pay for that flight that I did and all this sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. um, and so, um, so I was doing fine, but, but not like gangbusters or anything like that, but, but doing fine. And then um, what happened is everyone I would meet with wanted a piece. Um, so I met with an attorney we got done. He's like, so how can I get equity in this? You know, he, they, everyone would hear this idea. And by yeah. then I'd already had like a, a Forbes story come out, an ESPN story. And they were like, you know, I want a piece. And, and I was just like, oh God, I'd have to go find another attorney. And I met with an accountant. And he's like, so what are, you know, how much do you want to sell off an equity to me? And I'm just like, dude, I just want some accounting advice. Um, and so then I, I needed a website and I needed a little business acumen. So I, I'd met a friend of a friend. Um, and I linked up with him and, and he, you know, he had a lot of business experience. He, he was really savvy digitally. He had a good web kind of presence and understanding. And so I did partner as a, as a co kind of founder, not really, cause it was all me, but I gave him some equity to, to kind of help me with at least running the digital and getting some of the business side going. And that was a huge mistake, <laughs> terrible mistake. Um, and it wasn't, the mistake was, um, probably giving up too much equity and the fact that he had something else happen um, where he just had just became his life and, and so he went into that world and, and kind of left everything we were doing on the side where we were from a, a profit and equity standpoint in the early days hiring the first person which was Ben Weatherford was the scariest decision of my life because <laughs> you, you don't well for one, you know, that guy, he was like a knucklehead. So I got, I'm just joking. Um, I, so I knew Ben, Ben was a, he was a volunteer under me. Then he was a PT intern at the center for the intrepid. I knew him forever. His wife worked at the center for the intrepid. Um, but, oh, that I didn't know. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so you probably know too, you're just like, well, in the early days you're like, do I actually have enough money coming in to pay someone else, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and get at least a little bit for me to pay the rent. Um, and so that was back and forth and really low ball bin at the start, you know, like, and it was all I really think I could afford yeah. and, and brought him on. And then, then I saw the power of numbers. It's like, wow, okay, this guy is able to help a lot. And then we're doubling the trainings and doubling the work. Um, then we brought on an, another person to help take, you know, just general inquiries and work on the admin and the invoicing and then brought on more people. And, and then it's just like, now we're seeing like, if you can do it, bringing on good people is, is just amazing. And then that really is where you start to grow. And now it's like, where's the scale point now? Let's try and scale this thing up. So what was it about Ben that made you want to hire him? I'm going to put this on the spot because I've, I've talked to Ben a lot lately and uh, yeah. I, I just find him uh, very responsive, very, uh, very effective at communication. So I can see how Ben brought so much value to, you know, Owens when he was brought on and, and his diligence. Um, yeah. and I mean, he's, he's right up, right up in the physiology nerd, you know, category yeah. with you. So I, I can see how you two hit it off right away, but you know, in yeah. different, in different strides. So yeah, it, tell us a little bit more about that. Well, I, I always told him I hired him because he wouldn't leave me alone. And that's part <laughs> of the reason. So he, he just kept emailing me, you know, after he got out of PT school, like, Hey, is there any way I can, you know, intern with you more or work or whatever? Um, and, and he just, he would always come back and, and just say, you know, I really want to work with you and I really would love to do this. Um, and, and we also have a saying that we don't want to work with assholes, um, no matter what. So, um, people like that who are genuine, you know, uh, I know that he's going to treat others well. Um, he'll treat me well and, and we'll all respect each other was important. And he, he was like me and so many of our other folks they were living and breathing everything about this blood flow restriction stuff. So 
you know, it's almost to the point where I'm like at night, like, dude, stop texting me or calling me about this new paper. Or, you know, he's just like, couldn't stop. And I was like, all right, this guy's, you know, I, I know that he's going to give, you know, every little portion of him to, to what I think is important. And that's just being passionately um, motivated to, to do this. Well, what's something that you've learned now that you have it? So how many are on your staff right now with ORS? Yeah. So we have, locally in San Antonio, our corporate kind of offices, we have six. Okay. Um, and, and, and then we have, um, we have contractors now kind of throughout the world. So we have Kyle Kimbrell, who's our, who's our trainer kind of West coast, uh, Southern area, um, in LA, we have San Anton Golden, who's our Northwest trainer. Um, Susan DeSlip, who is up in Canada and Vancouver. So she kind of covers Canada and, and also now Taiwan. Uh, she, she just did like a whirlwind tour of Taiwan. Um, we have Zach Dunkel, who's over in Atlanta. Um, and, and now we've um, got folks throughout Europe. So in, the, in Austria, in Ireland, in the UK, in, in, in Spain, uh, about to be in Germany, um, in Taiwan. Um, that are con contractors for us who are doing everything from teaching to helping with some of our protocol development, um, breaking down studies, some, some of working with us on our research portfolio, um, which has become really massive now as well. So we almost have as much effort into our research portfolio as we do um, just the trainings and, and product distribution. Wow. That's, that's, uh, that's an impressive uh... An impressive, you know, geographical display of uh, of your instructors and, and contractors, like you mentioned. Um, what's yeah. what's something that you found is quite challenging keeping everybody on the same page, humming the same tune, um, speaking the same language, you know, whatever metaphor you want to say. Um, because it, w with even you know language barriers and, and everything that you have going on for you, um, there's yeah. got to be some some things that you've noticed. Like, oh wow, I didn't realize you know that that would be an issue. And so, man. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll say it in two parts. For one, global is just amazingly a pain in the ass. You, just the time zones alone, you know. I just had a call with Australia yesterday, and it's like our third attempt because I kept screwing up, you know. It's like Thursday there, but Wednesday here, whatever. And so uh, um, what one thing locally or, you know, that we did is we were all remote at first. And, and I just really wanted to be remote because um, I, I thought, you know, everyone's – big boys, big girls, and, and, and you can do that. And, and everyone could. Um, but what, what we found is when we actually got together as a team, um, the six employees here, it, we really, it was amazing the stuff that we would get done, you know, from just sitting around, like going through, you know, and I think we brought a lot of the military kind of like after action reports, what's the problem, how are we gonna fix it? You know, we're building all these SOPs and, and this and that. Um, so when we, got offices and brought all of our staff together that that was huge and and so that was completely different i always thought we would be kind of this remote thing because i knew I, just, I would have remote contractors all over the world um so having a corporate headquarters has been nice and then the the global piece it's, it's, it's so hard because every country is so different um so so different and so just the language barriers alone the price point barriers the regulations that go on in these different countries um, it's it's been very difficult not to crack you know I, I think you can just roll in and be like okay I'm gonna do a course here or there but to kind of roll in and be like we're this we're trying to be this global presence and we're moving in as like this is what we are in the United States this is now what this is gonna be in Germany um, or in France or in the United Kingdom um, is definitely much harder and it's obviously you know it's just a whole nother world and, and distance and all of that so I think knowing that having people in offices and headquarters, um, the global piece, I think we're going to have to look at that next is truly having like a, a brick and mortar. This is our U Europe um, office. This is our Asia office. Um, we're kind of moving towards that as well. Awesome. Awesome. Really, really exciting stuff. Um, yeah. Go, going back. So in the beginning, you kind of mentioned, you know, some mistakes you make kind of starting up the business and then, you know, even with equity and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I'm going to put you on the spot here. And what was, what was one mistake you feel comfortable sharing with us that you learned a ton from? And, and I mentioned this as well, that this is, this is purely selfish on my part because I really, really am, am enjoying the interviews on this podcast because 
I recognize my own shortcomings and, but I also want to be self-aware enough to the fact if I'm not an ideal leader for the businesses that I run, you know, how can I improve and take ownership uh, of my own shortcomings? So what, what are, just give us an example of something that you learned a ton from. Yeah, I'm, I'm big on, you know, taking ownership of your own shortcomings, but then expressing how you learned from it. Kind of like what you mentioned with the after action report. Yeah. Jeez. There's so, so many. Um, so for one, I think if anyone's going to start a business and they're going to go into a partnership, um, be very, very thoughtful um, and thorough of exactly what that means, why you're going into this partnership. Is, is everyone willing to, to put in equal amounts of time or amounts of time for what their equity stake holds? Um, because you, there's just a, a lot of butthurt on both sides of like, you're not doing enough and, or I'm doing more and, and whatever. And so that was a, a very costly mistake because um, I, I, I bought them out, um, bought out all the, the codes that I had. And so um, starting off, you, you, it's kind of everyone's happy and great until you make money. And then as the money starts to happen, then the, the whole conversation starts to shift a little bit. And, and so once you've done that, you can't get out unless you're willing to either fight it out, just decide we can move forward or go ahead and just break and pay. So that was a huge mistake. So anyone going into a business, decide exactly if you need partners or not. Um, and I don't know, you're, you're, you didn't have co-founders or anything like so that. So actually I did. So I started Midwest uh, Rehab Institute with my uh, rehabilitation professor in chiropractic school. And yes, so yes, that's right. He's my mentor, still is to this day, like an amazing human being and a really, really gifted clinician. Um, uh, and we were both, you know, ha juggling multiple different hats at the same time. And so we joined into this partnership. Um, and so to kind of, you know, expand on what you were saying is if you're if you must go into a partnership i would already have the terms of how the partnership would end written up front or have a, at least a discussion on how that partnership is going to end because otherwise you get to that point where you you realize oh you gotta you know this isn't this isn't working out for at least one person or the other the way that our partnership agreement was written up and and maybe yours was the same maybe it was different and there's many different ways that you can structure a partnership you know, I had, I was just a few years out of chiropractic school when, when we split and it was interesting in that he decided uh, that he wanted to, you know, step away, which I totally respected and understood. But then me buying him out, the interesting thing is that I'm, I'm basically paying him to go away. Um, so then he gets, he gets, uh, you know, compensated for stepping away, which is something that he, uh, he chose to do, which again, I also respected, but then actually the burden is put on me um, and the person that stays within the company. And again, it's kind of how the partnership was written is just that the one that stays um, is actually affected, but the one that leaves is leaving with a check. And so that's just something that I would think I would hope that, um, you know, guys and gals that are listening to this, if they're going into a partnership, that that's something that they take into account. So, yeah, for sure. So then I would say on that, do not skimp on paying the professionals to help you. Right. Um, from, from your CPAs to your attorneys, um, they, they're, you know, this 500 bucks, you know, a, a 15 minute or an hour or whatever, um, that makes your eyeballs pop out half the time. It's so worth it. <laughs> um, and, and, and use those people. And, and if you have to spend a little cash, it's definitely worth it. What, uh, what, what I had to come to grips with too. And I, I think most people should probably decide this early on is, is draw a line in the sand of, of what your company is and, and what you represent and, and try not to waver from that, you know? So we would, you know, almost start to get this mixed messages. Like we, we really just said like, look, we're clinicians. This is medical. We do this from a medical side and, and that's what it is. And all of a sudden it's like, Hey, we got all these personal trainers and strength coach all these other folks that are trying to get in and, and, and get with it. Like, Hey, how can we get involved? And, um, and then you're like, well, I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. There's maybe something we can do there. And then I had to really take a step back and be like, Nope, I, I want a really focused um, kind of perspective of exactly who we are for. Um, Cause I know I can support those people the best. Um, and, and those were, 
those, those were some of the, the best decisions I made of, of just saying, look, nope, sorry, we're not for you. This is exactly who we are for. Um, and from that, learning to, if I can say this is, you're my target person, and I know how I can help you, um, we really are working hard to make sure we take care of our customers. So a big mistake I had was worrying about the competition. Because there was no competition really at the start. I mean, it was nothing. Um, and then like this new thing would pop up or another thing, you know, it seemed like almost monthly. Now it's like weekly. And it's like, oh my God, okay, geez, I can't believe this thing. And then it's like, do we, what? And then, you know, it got to the point where I was like, I don't care. I really don't care. That's great. And, and my wife even reminded me, she's like, you said you wanted it out there. Um, and, and it's true. We do. And I'm, I'm, it's good that we're seeing that this is moving out. Um, and so we really went back to like, I, I'm not going to even worry about, you know, my problems I might have with this thing that came out. I'm just gonna worry about what we do and how I can take care of our people right now. Um, and it's everything from like, okay, what clinical trials can we do to help support you? What, what can we do to help you to go speak to your doctor? What can I do to answer your questions from a safety profile? Can I bring in any of my experts? Um, you know, from our, our science and advisory board. Um, so, so those are kind of some of the, the things that I, I had to learn the hard way a little bit. Um, sticking to my guns on pricing <laughs> is, was hard. Um, in a world where pricing had to be kind of made up, at least from a charging for the course, you know, the, the device we have, that was kind of set in stone because this company, they invented the, the surgical tourniquet line back in the 70s, 80s. Um, so they knew kind of where it was, but trying to understand this is the price. And when people say, I can't afford it, say, okay, I'm sorry, that's not for you. Um, no offense. I don't take offense to it. And, and some people would get mad at us, you know, and it's like, well, you don't go yell at Louis Vuitton because you can't afford the purse, you know, just go buy a coach or something. Um, and so for us, it's like, no, this is who we are. And, and if, if it's for you, it's for you. If it's not for you, it's not for you. But, but we think we can help you if you want to come into our orbit. Awesome. Well, you, you just answered my next question, which is what's important to you in regards to the ORS brand? And just w without even me asking it, you just nailed it. So, um, yeah. so thank you for thinking ahead already on that. Oh, yeah, um, sure. But um, I, I kind of want to just, as we kind of wrap up the last couple of questions here, as we're uh, approaching about the 45 minute mark, and I just want to respect your time. Um, yeah. As you're doing, you know, I keep hearing you say over and over again, um, you know, we wrote a paper or so then we decided to write a paper and then we, then we wrote another paper and then we came out with it. So how many papers have you authored or co-authored if you've even counted them? What are you up to these days? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Um, I mean, not a massive amount, you know, maybe in the thirties or something like that. Okay. So not a ton. Yeah. Um, and how much but, time would you say is dedicated to a paper? To, yeah. That's, that's a good question. Um, depends on the kind of paper. So if it's like just a review type paper, um, you know, it's just a lot of legwork of getting all the papers to review. And if you're doing a systematic review and meta-analysis, breaking down the stats on that. Um, weeks to months, usually. Okay. And then, so just a little, then bit, a little bit at a time, or you try yeah, to like knock out large no, of the yeah, day? No, yeah. No, a little painful bit at a time. <laughs> Sometimes with heavy amounts of bourbon, uh, heavy <laughs> amounts of coffee, whatever. But then if you look at these clinical trials, they take a whole lot of work. Um, they, they really do. And so, you know, like this giant femur fracture trial, we're trying to get up to 300 subjects. Um, it's been going on. I was still like full time at the military when, when we won the grant for it. Um, you know, that's like a seven year process. And that means you're, you know, I just uh, this morning we were discussing, we're bringing on Vanderbilt and University of Virginia um, as in two more sites. So we got to train them and make sure they're doing their stuff right. Calls uh, to check and see the progress, all the issues, protocol deviations. So these full blown studies, it's almost like a job um, trying to make sure the studies are going the right way. And, and we have John Hopkins kind of runs uh, our, our center that runs these. And so they're really heading off a lot of it. So I, I do a lot of, Helping with the studies, protocol development, IRB, jungle, and, and you know, hypothesis design. And, and really what I'm doing, because, and, and I have a conflict, you know, I have a, a, a device that, that we're the distributor of. And so I, I try and step away and let other people actually do the research. And, and sometimes they'll ask me to be a co-author, 
but I'm, they're the ones who are going through the research. They're doing the testing. They're running the stats. And then I can come in and help if they want some help in it. Or I've maybe guided them or they might have a question like, well, we, we were thinking this pressure. And I could say, well, you know, from this other study we're doing right now, this pressure seems to be working fine. These femurs aren't, we're not losing any dropouts, putting it right over the fracture side, right over the hardware. So I, I'm more of the, like an, an expert, expert kind of opinion guiding it, you know. So a lot of the studies I won't even put my name on just because I don't want to, to muddle up to that. Right, right. Well, uh, that kind of leads me into the next question I want to ask you, which is like, what does a typical day look like for you? Because if you've got all these little you know, projects you're working on, um, you know, do you have like your schedule lined out? Does someone do your schedule for you? Do you, you block out parts of your day? Like, tell, actually, let's do this. What does a normal day look like for you? <laughs> well, it starts in complete chaos because I have two crazy little girls um, <laughs> whose hair looks like thing one and thing two all over the place. So we, the first part is just trying to get my family in order. Um, I used to travel so much that um, it was really hard because, you know, I, I, I forgot the exact number, but it was, it was like in 44, 45 weeks of the, of the first year of my business, I was actually flying and, and traveling, you know, like I remember one SEC trip, like I, I landed, I, I worked in Oxford at Ole Miss. I think I visited with Jeremy and his lab for a little bit. Then I drove uh, to Mississippi State and then I drove back to Auburn and then drove back to, you know, so stuff like that like landing, trying to maximize and driving, like, okay, I'll be in Green Bay. Can I get over to the University of Wisconsin and all this sort of stuff while I'm there? Um, so it was, man, that was just, that was the hardest, 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 trying to run a business from an airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a great picture of me on the side of the road. Um, I'm taking a research call and I have my laptop with my Wi-Fi. Um, and there's like, four cups of coffee just kind of slammed on the side it's dark i've got my lights on and it's just like it looks like i'm in like like um whatever it is the uh, the the zo zombie show yeah, i was like in the, the the sticks of louisiana trying to run my business and all this other stuff now it's much more structured you know we have you know we have a team we have these these trainers going on we have courses you know we're doing the raiders tomorrow i, I didn't even know we were doing it um and, and so is but she's so busy now that, that she's doing <laughs> doing tons of other things because she's have, had to just kind of take on so we need to hire more people um i i get here i answer the the 900 emails that, that's the problem too you know we have six thousand trained people we're kind of like 1-800 bfr um it's kind of like seth said you know and, and and we will do this if you have a question and you are part of our group we will answer it for you if we have an answer and if I can't answer it, I will use our, our people to find the best answer. So we're just dealing with, and a lot of them are great questions, you know, hey, this guy has a popliteal aneurysm. Is it good for BFR? I don't freaking know. So we have a cardiothoracic surgeon on our board. So we'll talk to him and we have a vascular um, surgeon and we'll run these things by. So I get through all of that crap um, or good stuff too. The craps with all the other emails. Um, and then it's like whatever is due that day. I'm reviewing a, a grant that's been submitted. Um, we're working on a book chapter um, right now. Um, I've got all, we had a team meeting. We have our Wednesday team meetings. And so going over all of the problems that we need to fix or the good things and the high fives that we need to do. Um, we've done two podcasts today. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so that's what it is really. And then we're re revamping the website, updating the manual, reading papers constantly. Um, deciding what does and doesn't need to be taught anymore and, and deciding what we want to get out to the world and share through social and stuff like that. Well, you mentioned that you recorded a podcast. Were you a guest on another podcast or did you record yeah, another was, ORS one? ORS one this morning. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. How much fun did you have on that one? Cause you guys have it was a, good. a good time. No, this was good, man. Um, we went over uh, a, a new, a new study was presented at the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons this last weekend on BFR and the potential changes in bone after ACL. So yeah, it'd be good if anyone, if anyone wants to go check it out afterwards. These podcasts are hard to do, man. Like there's a lot, the time. Yeah, there's a lot of prep work that goes into it, you know, and, yeah. and I'm, sure, I'm sure, you know, like you, you guys yeah. run a, a pretty successful one already. You're on what your like seventh or eighth episode, maybe just came yeah, out probably. BFR, BFR yeah. and soccer, which, uh, you know, you mentioned your former soccer player as am I. And uh, yeah. so that one was near and dear to my heart. Um, and also confirms my bias, you know, cause a lot of times, at least in the in the U.S. here, 
um, th there's hit or miss. There's the, the soccer players that just want to play, they do whatever you can do, just get them back on the field. And then there's the, the other side, which they, they want to be bigger, fa faster, stronger. So they 100% buy in to what yeah. we're trying to do with BFR. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I, I appreciate how you and the, uh, the guests, who are the guests again that were on the BFR and soccer one? You had Reed from the Chicago Fire that was on there. Yeah, Paul Lombardo um, from the Sounders and, um, oh, geez, I'm blanking, from KC. Uh, Kurt, Kurt from, from KC. Um, so, yeah, great dudes, man. It was a good one. And, and we just did our course down in Barcelona. Some of the FC Barcelona guys were there, um, really doing a lot more in Europe. So we're, we're hoping to, to see some more stuff with soccer. You know, we, we've got a lot of the – football type studies going on the trauma stuff fractures and ACLs and cartilage um now for soccer and basketball I'm speaking of the NBA combine and you know I'm doing an update on what we think we should be looking at with this with basketball and it's the the analgesic response and what we can do for soft tissue injuries and the tendinopathy um the the, the sprains and strains and things like that so I'm hoping this starts to open up some new research lines as well yeah, I'm glad you brought that up too because I I would love to see, uh, and I know you had mentioned to me previously about working with Adrian Lau about some some uh, analgesic effects of BFR and potentially some research that you guys might be working on. Um, yeah, I, I've seen that you know clinically, empirically in the office here. Um, we've seen people come in with ankle injuries, you know, um, metatarsal, uh, you know, injuries, even running related, you know, stress reactions to the lower part of the leg, and uh, and out of nowhere, I, you know, I, I have it in their health history that they have patellar tendinopathy and then they just six or seven times patients have said, by the way, my knee feels so good right now. What are you doing to my yeah. knee? I'm like, we're, yeah. this is, I'm, I'm not doing anything. You're the one that's on the table doing the exercise. Um, yeah. so it's really, it's really interesting. I'd love to see how the effects of pain and, and for what prolonged state, you know, how long does yeah. the music effect last? So, yeah. That's so. That is a hot question. Actually, at the at the NBA Combine, that is that's one of the topics I'm, I've been asked to to speak on, is that analgesic effect. And so um, Stevens Group over in the UK, they're in Luke Hughes. They're they're really ramping up looking at that. The UK military, they just put out a paper with them, an inpatient study, um, and the UK military is very interested in that analgesic effect. And so yeah, it, it we get it so much. I mean, it's it's a very common thing. Um, some people are using it as a tool in the pro sports and college sports, like pregame, doing it and, and getting, you know, this player with this nagging injury through the game. Um, because even though you might need to shut them down, it's like playoffs and they, they just don't, you know, they, they can't shut them down right now. And they get this window of relief. Um, and, and, and so there's mechanisms that everyone's got different opinions, but there's even pre-surgical uh, ischemic preconditioning where you just put tourniquets on. For, for short bouts right before surgery, and it's been shown in total knee and um, before gallbladder surgery, if you do that, those patients post-surgery have less pain and have less narcotic use. Um, so that window of effect happened all the way through surgery and up to like 72 hours later. So, so it's really interesting. That, that's the magic question, you know, like, yeah. how long does it last? Do you, you know, one of the teams you know, asked me, like, do we have to do the whole protocol? Can we do one set? Do we need the full pressure, less pressure, you know? And so that, I think that's what we're hoping to tease out. Yeah, you need 60% pressure. You need to do one round of 15 reps and you'll get 30 minutes of relief. You know, that would be great yeah, if you do it yeah. to that. Because you don't want to max the dude or, or girl out, you know? Like right. now their muscles fatigued and they're going to be sore if they play. But, but from a patient's perspective, we love that because BFR sucks. It's hard. But if you get pain relief, you get some buy-in. And so right. that's usually, we're saying like, we always say test your ag afterwards. And if the ag is improved, lots of times say, great, see, this was worth it. So please come back and please pay your copay as you walk yeah. out. Yeah, please, okay. please. We appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. We had, uh, we had a, a patient at the office who um, was like a dental assistant and uh, or an orthodontic assistant. So she got, got braces from the doc that she was working for. So she's uh -huh. mid, mid 20s, you know, recreational runner, trying to complete a half marathon coming up here this, this summer, developed knee pain. So she came in and, um, uh, went through a couple bouts of a couple inflations, deflations with the BFR. And, uh, and immediately she said, I got my braces, you know, tightened two days ago and they've been killing me for two days. I feel nothing. Really? Right. And I was like, oh, that's, really? that's really interesting. And I said, well, do me a favor and don't think about it. But yeah. when, when you experience pain again, like look at the time, you know, it was about six o'clock at night. So 
she said the next time she came in, she said it was right before she went to bed, she noticed that her tooth pain, you know, just from the tightening of the of the braces came back about 9 30, 10 o'clock at night. So like, that that's a pretty nice window there where she didn't have any, you yeah. know, so it was again totally empirical. Who's to say it was BFR, right. maybe a whole host of other factors, but I yeah. thought, man, this is there's something to this. And all she was doing was, you know, knee extensions, long arc quads, yeah. a little bit of, you know, well, BFR. You know, so it was interesting. Yeah. Well, that's remote ischemic preconditioning is putting it on a limb and affecting a, a distal organ. And that's being done a ton in the cardiac world right now in all these studies. But everything from post-stroke to, you know, liver transplants and things like that, that a, a limb with hypoxia somehow does things to a remote organ. So that's crazy. Yeah, so good. yeah, so that's our market. We got to go for all the orthodontists. We got to go after them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be awesome. They, those guys have a ton of money. <laughs> <laughs> I know because well, my daughter's about to give it. Oh man, yeah, that's that's quite a process. Um, so yeah, just just kind of bring this bring this full circle here because uh, I, I do appreciate your leadership of me, but then also your leadership of, of the people uh, that, that are, you know, look up to you, whether, whether it's just through the courses that they take uh, through you and through RS and, and the other, you know, uh, instructors that you have. Um, so a, a parting question I've been, I'm going to start asking all of our guests on the, uh, uh, on our podcast here is what's, what's the number one book gift you give out to people? You know, it could be one, two, three, what are the top books that you give as gifts or that you just maybe tell someone, Hey, you got to read this book. Seth Godin's, um, man, I hope I got the, the title right. It's your turn. Um, I bought like 20 of them. Okay. And I, and I give that one out. Um, basically empowering people that, you know, it's your turn. It's your chance. It's almost like a coffee table book. It's very easy to read. Um, is, is one that I, I highly recommend. And I, and I give it out to people that, that I think would read it and, and find use from it. Well, that one I don't have. I've got about four of his other ones. Yeah, um, you're right. If it's like the other ones, like, you know, Purple Cow and um, I'm trying to think and all marketers tell stories, you know, if it's something like that, yeah. then yeah, then those are those are quick reads, but they're packed. You know, they're, they're this, got you know, from a business standpoint, I, I love the way guys like that think, you know, it's just you be the best at what you can do. And, and, and you know, if, if it's from your heart. It's from your heart and, and just do that. And if it's good, something will come from it. And that's what's happened with ORS. You know, we've added one brick at a time um, of like, this is what we do when we put it out and this is what we do and we put it out and people that seem to enjoy it, tell others, you know, we don't do real marketing. If, if, if anyone talks, I, it knows me, I barely know how to use Twitter um, or any social media platforms and I, I, I don't get on them. Um, we as a company do, but it's just more of like, hey, check it out. This paper came out or we just had this course. Here's some pictures of it. Um, but we are passionate about what we try and deliver. And so I, I, I kind of love that kind of thought of, of just treat your people well. You know, and I think we treat our staff very, very well. Um, their family, you know, we once a month we go. We have a little local Thai place. It's BYOB great Thai food. We bring wine and we just sit around and have fun at lunch on a Friday. Um, if we're in town, usually it's like a Thursday cause we're all having to fly out. Um, if I treat them well, they're going to treat our customers well. Um, and so I, I love that kind of stuff. Tom Peters. I love his books. He's great business leadership of, you know, just it, he's, he's brilliant and he's probably written the best business book of all time. Um, but it's, it's just so basic and, and true when you read it. It's, it's just basically treat people right. Don't be an asshole <laughs> and, and things will, will happen, you know, and it has. And, and I guess from my humble beginnings with this, not knowing what the hell I'm going to do, selling the house, selling the apartment, trying to figure out what freaking EBITDA is or stupid QuickBooks and all that sort of stuff. You know, we're thinking about uh, applying to the Inc. 5000 list um, cause we qualify this year and we have our revenues from, from last year. Um, we ran the numbers and, and off last year's, I think our ranking would be the 62nd fastest growing company in America off of their, their rankings. So it's very possible and you don't have to have an MBA. You don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to undercut. You don't have to have a race to the bottom. Just do what you think is right and stick to it and you can build something. And, and, and it's not for everybody. 
Um, but it can be for someone that I think has that approach. Wow, man. <laughs> I, uh, I, I completely agree. Um, and it's also a, a standard in which I'm, I'm trying to hold myself to and, and with our, our two companies trying to hold them as well. And so it, it's refreshing, it's challenging, and it's uplifting all at the same time because it's, it, it's a daily grind in order to try to achieve those, those very fulfilling moments uh, like your Thursday lunches with your, with your staff and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and the big picture thing, you know, getting the word out of BFR. Um, you know, I, I definitely think you're succeeding in that. You're doing a really great job of inspiring clinicians, you know, left and right all over the country and out all over the world. So I think you, you're, you're doing it right. You got a nice vision and a, and a great vision for what you're trying to accomplish as a company. Um, and I'm not just you know saying that because I'm on the podcast with you. I, I, um, I just, I, it's something, something about the way that your company and the reputation of you and, and the company reputation itself, it, it stands ahead of its, you know, ahead of itself. So when I, when I took a course, I already knew like what to expect. I knew it to expect a lot of research, a lot of evidence to support the, the Delphi unit. But I was also blown away on just the almost like the the, the things that I didn't expect out of uh, the course. Like I, I was not expecting the background into the military. I was not expecting to see a picture of just a, a busted up leg. Uh, <laughs> and so that hits home. And that that kind of just it brings you full circle on your story and your journey on on BFR and what you're trying to accomplish again worldwide to get the message out there. So. Um, you know, I can't thank you enough for, uh, you know, everything that you're doing for clinicians worldwide, but also for, you know, leading your staff and leading them so well. They've, they've been very respectful, very timely, very responsive, um, not just to me again, but to a lot of other people. And uh, another thing I'll leave, uh, leave to you is um, I really, really enjoy the Facebook group. So the uh, Owens Inside Circle for all the members. And you mentioned earlier, there's about 6,000 certified professionals worldwide. I don't know how many are on the Facebook group, but man, there is there's some fun stuff going on on the Facebook group. Yeah. But there's also like, you know, there's some important studies that you guys come across and we share some content and ask questions quickly and you guys follow up. So uh, another business move by, by creating the, the Facebook group was a nice touch. Um, it, it's just fun to be a part of like-minded professionals like you and Ben. And, uh, um, you know, just want to give you an opportunity, any closing thoughts for people out there, you know, and, and feel free to throw a shameless plug out there for the course and, and uh, anything that you have for us, we'd be, we'd be uh, you know, a nice, nice touching party gift here. Yeah. Well, no, thank you for those kind words, man. And um, it, it's always great to, to hear that when your baby is, is something that other people um, don't think is ugly. So uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Um, and, and no, I mean, I, again, I think my parting thoughts from a business side is um, um, don't take that responsibility lightly. Um, it's, it's a huge responsibility for someone starting a business, but also don't be afraid um, to, to go after it if it's something that, that you feel like it's, it's something that you can do. Um, yeah, and I don't really know if I have much more to, to add on that. Um, our, our website's owensrecoveryscience.com. We have blogs on there and other podcasts and hopefully information that the people might like. Um, so if they want to follow up there. And if you email that info at Owens Recovery, and you had a specific question ever for me. Anyone could always shoot it. And Tori, my assistant, pseudo assistant now, will get it to me and uh, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure to answer it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Johnny Owens, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Uh, we really appreciate your time, appreciate your insights, and appreciate your leadership. Uh, until next time, we'll have another round two sometime with you. Um, Good. But, uh, but uh, again, thank you so much for coming on. Appreciate the insights. And uh, we'll be back soon uh, with another episode of Midwest Rehab Institute's Clinical Leadership Podcast. So thank you, Johnny. Awesome. Thanks, Alex.